On the last branch of our subject, which is the most important, namely the special work for the accomplishing of which Christ appointed the two witnesses, it will be necessary to enlarge in making an application their work consisting, as we have seen, in contending for all divine truth, in its practical bearing upon individual and social man, and in opposing whatsoever is contrary to sound doctrine and the power of godliness. It may be inquired, quote, What is their peculiar and appropriate work in the present condition of the world? Unquote. Assuming that the doctrine, worship, government, and discipline of the Church of Christ, as also the constitution and administration of civil government, were duly settled according to the divine pattern in the Holy Scriptures, as exhibited in the symbols of the Covenanted Reformation, compiled at Westminster, and as those were received by the Church of Scotland, it would follow that the special business of Christ's witness, witnesses excuse me, is to build upon that foundation, but inasmuch as that glorious reformation was really and speedily overthrown in the British Isles, and the scriptural foundation then laid has been since covered with accumulating heaps of anti-Christian rubbish, much of their labor of their legitimate successors has been employed in removing this and endeavoring to keep the foundation visible. The whole of that work was completed so far as it progressed by an open profession of faith in Christ and a solemn engagement to obey his law, both sealed, both sealed in covenant form. Excuse me. Both the principles deduced from the lively oracles and the manner of their application in individual and social life are to be ascertained only from history. The various steps of defection or apostasy from that reformation can be known only from history. The witnesses have put upon record a narrative of their own life and times, and they only are qualified for that work. In vain will any inquirer find their true character or work delineated in the pages of the popular writers of civil and ecclesiastical history, much less than the historical romance which Babylon's sons and daughters have fabricated for the amusement of her tender little ones. As these two witnesses represent and embody God's covenant society, so they are the only truly historical community whose annals run parallel with the wheels of time. Cities are raised and perished with them in their memorial. Kingdoms arise in the earth and flourish for a time, but they are soon supplanted by others. It is otherwise with Zion. God will establish her forever. It has been the aim of Antichrist all along to divide and conquer these witnesses. The civil and ecclesiastical beasts act in concert for their overthrow. The two-horned beast, the false prophet, makes it his business to steal the words of God with the design to deceive them that dwell upon the earth. Each assumes that to exercise the prerogatives of Christ, to reign by divine right, a right from heaven to act on earth as the vicegerents of the mediator. Thus all the heads of the civil beast are marked with the names of blasphemy, wrote Revelation 13, verse 1. Quote, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Unquote. The witnesses, verse 6. To this he is instigated by the false prophet who is who, in Christ's name, blaspheming his name, demands and commands, quote, submission to the powers that be, unquote. The Pope of Rome and his vassals are the antitypes of the ten horns of the first beast, and who have learned this policy from their spiritual father, all assume a blasphemous headship over the church within their civil jurisdiction. The purple-clad woman sits upon the scarlet-colored beast, the almost living symbols of an apostate church and state, the former directing and urging the latter to deeds of blood for both are represented with garments dyed in the blood of the saints. It is their meat and their drink to do the will of their father, who was a murderer from the beginning. And here it is proper to notice that not only on the continent of Europe, but in Protestant Britain, the mitre and the crown have often been, have often been stained with the blood of the martyrs. Yes, at the present moment, in 1859, that horn of the beast insults the majesty of heaven, denies the Father and the Son by giving an establishment to paganism in India, popery in Canada, prelacy in England and Ireland, and a restricted Presbyterianism in Scotland, the chief magistrate being head of all these churches, and all by the authority of Christ, quote, by the grace of God, unquote. Can anything be conceived more blasphemous? Such facts as these the witnesses collect from history, bring them to the law and to the testimony, and in the name of the Lord pass judgment upon them. Deprive them of history as a term of communion, and they are deprived of life. The same is true of argument. They must confess their father's sins with their own. They must have understanding of the times. They must assert and maintain the Protestant doctrine against the man of sin, quote, that all necessary deductions from the words of Scripture are of divine authority, unquote. And these things cannot be done without the use of history and argument. 
But it will be asked, quote, does not saving faith rest on divine testimony, unquote? Certainly. But when did the two witnesses believe or teach that saving faith is a term, and especially the only term, of communion in the visible church of Christ? Never. They left that dogma with the infallible fraternity of Rome and their legitimate progeny, the enthusiasts of Germany and affiliated sectaries of England, Baptists and other independents. Christ's witnesses have not professed to have the miraculous gift of discerning spirits. All such power and signs and lying wonders they habitually renounced and cordially detested, as may be seen in their historical footsteps marked down in their solemn covenants, the terms of communion among the witnesses are resolvable into an agreement in principle and practice deduced from the Holy Scriptures by themselves. And they have told us that, quote, to shift the terms of church fellowship from such agreement to the supposed goodness of persons is most dangerous, unquote, is a most dangerous, unquote, excuse me, course. Let their professed followers be admonished by their mature judgment and experience. God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Alas, too many of the children, teachers and taught, these things are a blank, as soon as a book that is sealed, excuse me, as a book that is sealed. Reformation principles exhibited, without corresponding practices, the banner of the covenant, together with other cognate false lights, have well nigh quenched the light in many minds of our covenanted testimony. This also was the effect of the indulged in Scotland in the 17th century after the national overthrow of the cause of God. They and their abettors conspired to obstruct the rays of heavenly light which the witnesses endeavored to diffuse in their guilty land. Such struggles will be made by the carnal mind to exclude that light which, when admitted, excuse me, gives energy to the accusations of a guilty conscience. Such rebel against the light, quench the spirit, furnish occasion for faithful contendings yea, earnest contendings and wrestlings on the part of the witnesses. The witnesses have affirmed constantly that faith without works is dead, being alone, that there must be a continuance both in doctrine and fellowship to evince their apostolic origin and legitimate succession. But in the view of the light and social progress of the 19th century, the multitude of benevolent societies organized for the express purpose of effecting political, moral, and spiritual reform, what place is found, what occasion given for the continuance of the witnesses? Are not the nations of Europe and America all avowedly Christian states? Are not the churches Christian churches, especially Protestant churches, the churches of the Reformation? Such questions are popular and prevalent, and the objections which they imply contain a degree of plausibility. Let the following facts be considered. Human nature is corrupt. Man is helpless since the fall. Genesis 6, 5 and Romans 3, verses 10 through 18. The prevailing theory of man's recuperative powers is at once at variance with scripture and experience. Romans 5, verse 6. Wars and fightings come of the lusts of men, duelings, robberies, murders, accompanied by all circumstances of cruelty and brutality, continue to be perpetrated in city and country, as attested in the current news of the day. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out and blood toucheth blood. All this is verified in private and social life. Now, of such elements are composed the social organizations of mankind. Man is an enemy to man, because he is first an enemy to God. The unjust judge, whether an ecclesiastical or civil judicator, who fears not God, will not regard man. Such are the little antichrists who, in the aggregate constitution, the great antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son, it is still the character of the civil beast that there is given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Revelation 13, verse 5. The same is true of the little horn, the ecclesiastical beast, the false prophet. Daniel 7, verse 25, and Revelation 13, verse 11, as well as Revelation 19, verse 20. And their combined blasphemies are never so blasphemous as when uttered in the name of the Lord by divine authority. As Christ's vicegerent, the Pope, forbids to marry and commands to abstain from meats, institutes sacraments, holy days, image worship, etc., and anathematizes all recusants, by the grace of God, the sovereign of the British Empire, among other blasphemies, usurps Christ's throne as supreme judge in all causes, as well ecclesiastical as civil, dictates the faith and worship of the subject, except those authoritatively tolerated. 
by an equal usurpation of Jehovah's prerogative, the people of the United States disown any higher law, abrogate any religious test, and ordain slavery, trading in the bodies and souls of men, subjecting the life, liberty, and property of about every sixth person to the dis despotic will of his fellow, attempting with equal impiety and inconsistency to ratify and confirm the enormity by an appeal to patriarchal institutions on his heads the name of blasphemy. All the remarks apply, in whole or in part, to every other nation within the geographical boundaries of Christendom. Next, it may be asked, quote, Are the churches implicated in these sacrilegious robberies of God and invasions of human rights? Unquote. Yes. Though the princes be chief in the trespass, the priests and prophets and all the people of the land are involved. There is an unholy alliance existing and of long continuance betwixt the two beasts. The beast of the earth causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, Revelation 13, verse 16. The mark is that of the first or civil beast at the instigation of the other. An apostate church commands, under awful pains and penalties, allegiance to the civil power, verse 13. The same alliance and cooperation is presented more plainly in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 3. The woman is carried by the beast. The beast is controlled by the woman, verse 7. The church is supported by the state. The state is molded by the church. There are cardinals and lord bishops in the legislatures and cabinets of the nation, and there are many, very many other ecclesiastics who, though destitute of titles of dignity, wear soft raiment and are in king's palaces. Could popery exist in Spain, France, Austria, prelacy in England and Ireland without the influence of the hierarchy? Could infidelity, slavery, Mormonism exist in the United States without the concurrence of the church? And what shall be said of Freemasonry, odd fellowship, and kindred combinations of Christians and infidels, whether angels of light or of darkness, but that they are the inventions of men, whose faith no longer relies on the ordinances of divine institution. St substitutes they are, and often avowedly so, for the resources of the covenant of grace, which, it is assumed, has failed to reform the human race. This is the doing of the false prophet, the mother of harlots, who is equally the mother of all these abominations. The kings of the earth and many others have committed spiritual fornication with the mother and many of her daughters. The golden cup, worldly gain, and sensual gratification have proved irresistible incentives to multitudes in the church as well as in the state to renounce allegiance to Zion's king, the prince of the kings of the earth. And while these unhallowed combinations continue to subvert or counteract the great ordinances of heavenly origin, a gospel ministry and a scriptural magistracy, the witnesses must prophesy to give testimony against them and judicially to pass sentence upon them is their appropriate work. And, like their divine Lord and exemplar, they shall not fail nor be discouraged till he, through their instrumentality, had set, has set judgment in the earth. The kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. The little stone, cut out with, without hands, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and they shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. God's people sing of mercy and of judgment, Psalm 101, verse 1, and their prayers are often answered by terrible things in righteousness, Psalm 65, verse 5. They are his remembrancers, Isaiah 43, verse 26, and all the judgment denounced against the enemies of the church are mercies promised to the church, Psalm 136, verses 17 through 20, so that the harvest of God's wrath and the vintage, the final overthrow of rebellious nations and apostate churches, is to take place in answer to the prayer of the witnesses, Revelation 14, verses 15 through 18. He has engaged all his perfections to avenge his own elect that cry unto him. When he maketh inquisition for blood, especially martyr blood, he then remembereth the humble, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. He forgetteth not their prayer. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. Great Babylon shall come in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And the kings of the earth that have committed fornication with her will so change their policy that the hatred wherewith they shall hate her will so change their policy shall be greater than the love wherewith they loved her. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast till the words of God shall be fulfilled. Then the ten horns shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for strong is the Lord God that judgeth her. Thus are the witnesses destined to overcome the confederated hosts of Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And while the high praises of God are in their mouth, 
They will invoke the aid of all holy beings in setting forth the glory of God and of the Lamb, saying, quote, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Unquote. Thus shall these two prophets, in view of their enemies, ascend to the heaven of civil and ecclesiastical power. Chapter 11, verses 12, and chapter 20, verse 4, and reign with Christ a thousand years. Standing on the sea of glass, mingled with fire, they will celebrate their victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. Their victory will be complete, their triumph glorious. Let us, uninfluenced by the popular theology and unscriptural worship of our time, adopt their principles, cultivate their spirit, and emulate their example, their praise, and their prayers. Unquote. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Unquote.